We've got the main man online. We've been, we gave a bit of a preview to this yesterday's episode. Simon Lawson, uh, non-executive director of Labyrinth. No, no, sorry, uh, managing director of uh, Gascoin Resources has decided to join the show today, mate. Simon, thanks for reaching out. Great to have you on, mate. How are you? Yeah, good, good, good. Thank you for that, uh, Matt. And that was a nice little segue that you managed to to sneak in there. Thank you for that. <laughs> Pure, purely accidental. Uh, <laughs> of course, of course, <laughs> mate. You pumped out an announcement today. The never, never deposit. The hits keep on coming, and we are going to get into that today. And. We want to give a bit of a, I guess, a bit of a sequence of events, the backstory of, I guess, the, well, the Firefly Gascoin journey all the way through to administration, coming out of it and building this Never Never Deposit. So what do you reckon, mate? I think they avoided yeah. administration, didn't they? Yeah, well, this time the administration, my bad. <laughs> no, no, no. We 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 avoided it this time. I'm very I'm very careful about that one. And it was a it was a strategy that we we obviously employed to remain solvent through the process of putting the plant in care and maintenance, and then recapitalizing and coming through the other side, so that we can actually you know start to put out some of these announcements without the shadow of of a, an operational performance that wasn't you know overly worthy of talking about. Um, you know, and that's that's no disservice to anybody that was there. We we tried very hard, and I suppose if I take it back, I'm not going to go right back to the first uh, administration. There was there was a a gas going that started out, uh, ran into some headwinds post uh, development, and then entering production, there were some issues with the resource model and reconciliation, and that resulted in them. Uh, struggling financially. And no, then, I mean, it's a project you know, that never would have been financed if if the DD was correct. done properly, right? Correct. And that's exactly, um, you know, and I've made that point a few times and it does sort of tweak a few people's uh, sensitivities because I'm fairly straightforward about how I put these things. It's not so much about feelings. It is about facts in this case because it never would have been financed if it had, uh, I suppose, if it had been resourced properly to start with. And again, you know, I don't want to throw shade on uh, on how that was done, there were some there were some grades that were driven from lower down in the fresh environment up into the oxide environment, and that misrepresented uh, the answers and the grade that could be achieved through that mill. And I think that sort of you know it was a struggle. But what that did, and, and I suppose I always try to learn from you know what you see in front of you. You are a product of your experiences, and for me to come into that environment, uh, you know not so long ago was to look at that and learn from that and say, well, this, that's what we're not going to do. We're, we're not going to overstate the resource. We're not going to overstate the answers in that particular environment. We're going to be very careful. We're going to get external um, peer review on these things, you know, and, and some very smart people have had a look at what we're doing here. And, you know, it, it's one thing for an MD to say, oh, look, this is the best thing that's been found in the last decade. But, you know, it is every time we drill holes into it and we, we see these diamond cores down plunge and, you know, some people have said it's a, it's an infill hole we put out today. That is true. We are drilling this out to to have you know massive confidence over. It did what look we like a pretty peppered area. <laughs> yeah, look, and, and it, there is a reason for that. It's um, and it's an interesting one. I like to I like to talk about that because I had a few people say to me, "Well, look, it doesn't look like you know what direction you're drilling in." And to be perfectly honest, at the start we were kind of confused because we were drilling an ore body that ostensibly had been striking for kilometres in a north south direction. And that's what the whole, you know, project had been built on, was this stratigraphic hosted low grade ore body that had pretty significant volume to it. But it didn't really excite me. Um, I'm an underground guy for, you know, the last 17 years of my career, and I love high grade. You know, if it's below five, I, I kind of look at it and go, well. And this, this, it took me a while to get my head around it. And I thought, well, okay, look, let's optimize the operation. Let's see if we can't reduce the cost or increase the grade because those are the, those are the two levers you can sort of play with to to make an operation work. And I've done that, you know, at other operations with other teams, Plutonic out of Northern Star. You know, there's been plenty of other stories in, in my past that I've learned from. In in this case, it was like, okay, let's see if we can make this work. And it was pretty clear um, from the outset, we, we you know, de-risked the balance sheet. We got rid of the hedge book. We removed the Investec facility there. We took a con note to our biggest shareholder at the time to help us do that. We used various different financial instruments to, clear the decks uh, and then tried to optimize the mine plan and and see if we could sort of mine our way out of what was a difficult you know difficult environment but obviously with escalating costs and the covid hangover 
it became pretty clear that you know that wasn't you know one good quarter is not going to make the mind work. So by the time we got to you know October November, we were really seriously considering how do we reset this. We'd made a discovery on the way through, which you know when <clears throat> when you can't control things like costs and you know your mining schedule, you're really pretty much fixed. If you can't fix the mining schedule and you're doing it as best as you possibly can, the only thing you can really change is the grade, and that is impossibly hard to do you know most people would look at that and say that's you, you're not going to do that you're either going to high grade the ore body you've got or you have to find another ore body hey, so, so we looked before at you can you put some yeah. numbers on the when you said the resource grade compared to what the actual head grade was that was going through a mill how much of a discrepancy there was oh look i can't speak too much for it but let's just say the whole project was financed at over a gram in terms of what they were going to put through in a, in a head grade sense and it reconciled under a gram Mm -hmm. so, and then low recovery yeah, on top of that. Correct. So you're talking sort of a 20% discrepancy, um, which blows most of your cash flow models out of the water. And then you have recovery issues. Um, you know, there's some there's some shale there. There's quite a bit of silver in, in the um, stratigraphic hosted loads as well. And for me, I'm just looking at that thinking, okay, if we can't optimize that and you've got all those things working against you and you can't control those things, then what can we control? And then, you know, taking on... The absolute unicorn, which is trying to find a better grade source of ore for a mill that's two and a half million tons per annum while it's operating, is a very difficult situation, you know, because you do have the pressure of all that operation and trying to maintain cash flow, uh, you know, and we we were negative for the last six months before we shut down, and you know we didn't want to take the risk. The board and I we made a what I think was a pretty reasonable decision based on the fact we'd made a really good discovery halfway through last year where we were drilling, found the extension to the main ore body after listening to the geologists that had been there for a while. You know, they'd, they'd been there through, some of them through the administration the first time and they knew where some holes were that, that needed to be followed up. So I'm, I'm pretty keen that, to talk about that decision at the board level, Simon. So maybe yeah. maybe we'll, 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 we'll touch on that. But, but before we get there, like, you know, you talked about that October, November period. Like what, what numbers are you seeing? What are you like you're inside the company at, at the board and management level? What are the things mm. that are happening? Put never, never aside, but just from an operational perspective, that are kind of informing the environment of the journey you're about to go on. Yeah, look, it's a very easy one. Um, you know, start of the financial year, we had thirty million bucks, and by that point in time, we had twelve. So, it was a very easy decision. We, we, we looked at it and we went, we can't afford to be negative cash flow for, for much longer. We have to make a brave decision here. And we either shut it down and shut the whole company down and put it into administration or we turn around, uh, try and do it solvently, you know, meet all the credit obligations as much as we can and get through to the other side and, and recap this thing on the basis that we have this amazing discovery. So they're, they're all integri integrally related. Right? So at what, at what point are you kind of kicking off these discussions with, with the board and, and advisors? <laughs> well, when your um, you know your monthly reconciliation is not coming in quite where you want it to be, and your cash flow is negative for most of that period that we were you know going backwards from thirty to twelve, there was many discussions. So, um, so October or September or uh, it was earlier than that. Yeah, yeah. So that. We, yeah, yeah. At, at a board level, we're, we're looking at it and thinking, well, you know, because and we have a very active board, right? Like there, there are some examples that aren't. Probably quite as active, but when you're in an operational sense like that, it is very dynamic, and you have to be very quick. And to totally. me, you have to pay attention. So yeah, that, that's what we were doing. We we're having those discussions. We we're talking about what our options were. We yeah. knew what our creditor obligations were. There were some termination payments. There were some big numbers there, and so it was a scary proposition. You know, we're looking at that, thinking, okay, where do we get the money for for, for that? How and do we and do what, that? at what point do you do you sort of you know call up Quartamenta? Uh, well, look, I had a really good discussion with Sternship Advisors, uh, with with the team down there, uh, and you know they basically said, "Look, there's there's a few options you've got. Um, let's have a chat to the guys from Cordamenta." Uh, and I spoke to a couple of guys down there. Uh, I won't name them, but they are superstars, um, and they really Andrew Reid. You know, he's quite good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Andrew and 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 uh, Richard Tucker as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> You've got it out of me. But basically, <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I'm happy to rep all those people. I just don't know um, if they, you know, well, I've said it anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But th those guys are rock stars um, at what they do, and they really did help us with the confidence to be able to conduct this process. It's not an easy process, right? There's, 
there's a bunch of people we had to make redundant. There were some creditors we had to have some hard discussions with, and there were some numbers that were expectations that weren't met. And we had to deal with that, and we had to settle on new terms. So, right? so, so, so you, 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 you kind of you have the conversation with, with quarters because of you know Sternship's advice. I guess I'm trying to understand. You know, you, you, I guess you have that conversation because you think administration is a real, um, yeah, possibility yeah, 100%. here. And, and, 100%. I, and I guess like it, you know, from from Sternship's side, they're probably putting forward a bunch of strategic options towards you and your board. Um, I would, I would have thought that. That some consolidation options would be a part of you know whatever whatever they would have put forward we, your way. We, absolutely, mate. Yep, a hundred percent right. So they are you know well connected. Um, they obviously have some very smart people in that business as well, um, and they gave us plenty of options. Yeah, we researched all those options. We approached lots of different people. Everyone loves a fire sale, right? So we had some we we had some crazy numbers coming back from various different people with smiles on their faces because they could see an opportunity. And for us, that was kind of like, okay, well, we, do we take the hard path here and and actually do it ourselves and and you know attempt to recapitalize this? And the answer was yes. If if that's the path you go, then we need a cornerstone. So, so when, you, when you say fire sale, do you mean like a nil oh, you, a nil a premium asset, merger, right? a nil premium merger sort of thing, or like what are we, what are we, what are we talking uh, no, about? No, not so much that because. Well, I, I suppose, but that was never really um, that was never really on the cards, right? Yeah, what, what, not a merger option, but there was there was some there was definitely some. We'll pay you this much money for you to walk away type offers. Gotcha. Yeah, and yeah. when you have something like Never Never, where you've just drilled fifty four meters, uh, you know, of six and a half gram a ton in an ore body that's never seen those sorts of grades, and you've only just started working it out. I mean, fifty nine meters at twelve and a half. 32 meters at 8.6, you know, there was some crazy numbers there and and we had to put a lot of faith in that. So there were some hard discussions, but they were some, you know, the, the, I suppose the board put the faith in me that what I'd seen before and what I was seeing in these drill holes was actually worth fighting for and to make sure that we actually realized the value for our shareholders. So, 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 so the on the value for the shareholders point, I guess the question I'm getting to is, you know, if, if, were any of those strategic options, would, would they have, you know, resulted in... Um, your existing shareholders getting, you know, a hundred cents on the dollar at that point in time. No, that's would, would, an easy would, answer. Would, would they? Would, it, would, it, would any of those options resulted in your shareholders getting more than fifty cents on the dollar, as sort of came about via the equity raise that was the ultimate deal that occurred? Mm. So, uh, good question. I, I would say that there has been, and still is to to some extent to this day, um, some animosity towards the Firefly. Uh, acquisition by Gascoigne, um, and I can't speak for the decision that was made prior to that because obviously I, I was the target. But at that point, you know, the the Westgold offer that was on the table um, ostensibly um, was viewed as reasonable, and there were some people that were quite keen to take advantage of that deal. But unfortunately, there was a Supreme Court hearing that that saw off that particular. Um, situation because we had a we had a deal we had a contract and it was it was binding yeah yeah well i get that i guess my my question is not about that deal it's more about the you know the this re- recap that you've undertaken right it was yeah, yeah. um you know priced at a 50 percent discount the, the equity component so your existing existing yeah. gascoin shareholders you know their equity gets repriced to get a 50 percent haircut on that that's a pretty Correct. a pretty big pretty wipe healthy. to take yes. and and i guess i'm trying to wonder is like you know as a as a, as a managing director in the board yes. you're trying to act in the best interest of your existing shareholders not new shareholders Correct. your existing shareholders um yep. and when you look at the deal i sort of think did you have to do a 50 percent haircut or could you have just you know sold sold the, either the company or the asset and returned cash or shares to those existing shareholders in a deal that would have resulted in them getting close to a hundred cents on the dollar rather than 50 mm. cents on the dollar. And so I just no. want to know what, what that, that, that's not a scenario. Okay. That, that, that's not a scenario that would have played out. Um, I, I can tell you for a fact, um, okay. we, we would not have been returning very much to shareholders at all. There were some very low ball offers there, not, not anything worth taking seriously or announcing. And that's why we didn't take yep. that path. Um, the options, and I'll sort of answer your question with another question. The alternatives we had was, you know, we had to ask ourselves, are we prepared to run the gauntlet on this and potentially drive it into administration, lose control of the asset, and then shareholders get what an administrator gives them, Yeah, which is yeah. ostensibly nothing yeah, uh, or very little? 
Yeah. So, uh, or, so the or, other op, the other the people who were interested in 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 the company were perspective were potentially actually just thinking I can pick it up out of administration cheaper. Is, uh, that, is that what you're alluding to? Okay. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. Look, and I had that very barefaced statement made to me a number of times. And that, look, that's fine. Look, no begrudging. It's an opportunity when a company is in this much stress, right? And publicly, we were in stress, and you could see it. Uh, on the daily basis, we're very transparent about the process. Um, you could, you could totally tell what was going on. We obviously were drilling some amazing numbers, but at the same time, going backwards, and then we had to make the hard call. And I feel like we've made the right call based on you know what we're continuing to see and what we know is there, and, and what we've delivered to the market today is that this is you know a, a company with all of its infrastructure intact, all of its shareholders are still there. Yes, there was a a very dilutionary. Um, capital raise but we we made sure to offer you know a rights issue out there and and that's bittersweet to some people because they look at it and think well you know i've been there since before the first administration and i'm still there and i'm i'm still trying to you know average down doing what i'm doing at the moment and you're still not there for me to sell out but the plan is to to escalate is to remove that operational risk from de-risk the balance sheet which we've done all of those things we've removed that operational risk now we've recapitalized the company we're funded for the next you know 15 months from this point to turn this thing into a five-year mine plan in front of an infrastructure that's already paid for with no debt at this stage so for me that that represents a unique opportunity in this in this market you've got operators who are struggling quarter to quarter to actually you know put out realistic AISC numbers you've got people putting out PFSs which to me, you're going to struggle to get funded in this environment because people can see the capital risk there. Uh, and then, you know, you've got explorers who are talking about potential. We, we, we're talking about fact, right? We have an, an amazing ore body in front of pre-built infrastructure. There's not many other um, peers in that space. Simon, I've got another one just on the funding. So uh, you and the board sort of looking at the, the various tools you have to get this um, – to where it's at now and you look mm -hmm. at royalties. So it looks like there's a 2.5% royalty from um, the various groups, Deutsche, Balaton and um, Tembo on Correct. the Dalgaranga stuff. So was that something more that they came wanting or was it uh, uh, something that Gascoigne had sort of pitched to sort of minimise that dilution? No, look, I'm not a huge fan of royalties. Um, and I will be straight up, I wasn't a huge fan of, of putting this in place. But when you look at the alternatives, you know, it's always about the alternatives. What is it, what what can you do other than this to give someone an upside to be able to come in and actually fund what you need to do? And the faith that we have in this this major deposit and the fact that there is probably more of them there that we, we're starting to, to unlock in front of this infrastructure how do you secure that opportunity and make sure that the shareholders that have been there for so long actually see the reward come from that? And yes, a royalty is something I'm not a big fan of, but we have a you know a half percent buyback on it. And to me, it was a it was a price I was prepared to pay to to get it across the line and make sure that we we continued. You couldn't we, you couldn't you know, get a buyback on the full royalty. Uh, look, I'm I'm told that there is a you know a commercial discussion to be had there, but I mean. As with everything, it's got a price attached to it. How's a just a bit of context? How does a half percent buyback work? What does that mean? Well, at the moment, you know, there's a royalty shared across two different parties, Tembo and Deutsche Peloton. Uh, the half percent buyback, basically, within four years, we can buy back that half percent, uh, and it's pro rata off both those parties, by the way, at the rate that they acquired the royalties at. So it's a it's an even split between the two parties, and then we end up with a two percent. Um, and look, I won't talk about strategy around royalties and, and when is the best time to do those kinds of things, but we certainly have a plan to you know reach a decision where we want to turn the plant back on and produce gold uh, as per our presentation that we put out and our strategy that's in place and, and is going very well um, by the middle of next year. That, that's what we, you know, we want to be looking at that and saying, do we want to turn the plant back on right now? And then we have a discussion about where the royalties sit. So the Never Never deposit, was this the – big driver of this I guess the whole deal and the, the way it's gone I know you said the other options weren't as good but was the primary objective to retain a hundred percent of this never never deposit which is potentially Correct. a very good underground operation by the yes. way of the hits yeah yes Matt absolutely mate cutting through it um you know seven to nine gram underground grade uh from inferred to to indicate it, it, it is uh, an exceptional ore body of exceptional volume um, in terms of widths. And to me, it, it is something I've never seen before. And 
you know, to, to have the confidence to say, this is why we need to hold on to this. This is why we need to go through this funding process. Yes, we want to minimize the cost to us and to the shareholders on the way through. Yes, there was a dilutionary process and a royalty that was attached to that. But at the end of the day, we have retained the ownership of that and the plant that sits right next to it, which gives us an absolute advantage, um, particularly in the in the high cost environment that we're seeing at the moment. So yes, that's what gave us the confidence to do that. If that ore body wasn't there, it may, but in fact, it would have been a very different outcome. Simon, I've got one more. Just looking at the breakup of that 50 million of capital that you guys have now got, looking mm -hmm. at 11.6 million in care and maintenance, that's relatively high. Is that um, going to be the ongoing sort of rate? So care and maintenance across the um, 15 to 18 month period is the right number. Um, if you refer to the 5B that came out, we've got you know, um, 6.5 there in care and maintenance for the quarter. So I've been asked questions about that recently. Um, it's pretty easy to explain. There were some one-off um, liability extinguishment payments that we had to make, but the, the run rate on care and maintenance is going to be about half a million bucks a month, right? Okay, Ongoing. great. Yeah. And just another one on, on the use of funds there, exploration. There's talk of building a, a decline to do exploration drilling. Is that going to be covered by that $27 million That is budgeted for yep. out of those funds, yes, 100%. So we've got that application into uh, Demers at the moment, and we expect to see that uh, hopefully in September, hopefully earlier in August would be great. Um, but we did all the pre-work for that, so the geotechnical, hydrological, um, you know, waste characterization, all that sort of stuff uh, during the period where we were waiting to do the recapitalization over the, over the Christmas period. So and earlier this year. So we were very well advanced in terms of what we needed to provide to Demers to make that decision. Um, and we are, you know, obviously working really closely with the department to make sure that we get that exploration decline in because it is critical for us to put that piece of infrastructure in there to allow us to access the deeper parts of this ore body. And then, you know, it has the secondary um, advantage of being mined at a, at a dimension that is amenable to, to haulage. I've got a couple, couple more curly, curly ones for you on the deal, uh, Simon. Um, <laughs> Beautiful. So, I, I, you know, I guess the the line of questioning I'm 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 sort of going here is is you know what were the options available to you and the board because you, you chose one that um, yeah kept the kept the lights on, but you know there was a bit of a, a lender of last resort dynamic with the uh, mining PE group um, who who wasn't an existing shareholder yet, who um yet to sort of you know give give away a royalty and a, and a great entry price to. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah look, and that's, that's, you can disagree with that characterization. That's okay. No, 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 no. That's fine. That's fine. And look, that is perfectly fine as an analysis. Um, you know, f for me, Tembo had had some exposure to me at Firefly um, as a as a person, as a as an MD at Firefly at the Melville project. I'd taken the guys um, Tim Dudley and John Hodder up to Yelgu and we'd walk around up the ground. They were visiting the area and they wanted to see the project. Uh, and that was prior to their involvement with this. Yeah, but they, they um, look at they look at like three hundred things a year, and 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 only of course, but, it's not. But but obviously, um, you know, investments are more well from my point of view. Investments are more about people, right? Because assets are great, but if you don't have the right people to run them, then it it doesn't realise the value that you know the asset can. So I wouldn't want a great I'm, person in, in on moose pasture, though. I mean, like, <laughs> both matter. <laughs> well, no, exactly right, and you see plenty of examples, um, but. Tembo is very astute from a due diligence point of view, and they drove me, uh, you know, to the point of distraction, which was great. I, I saw that as a really strong, um, you know, due diligence process. If if they were asking all the right questions five times, five different angles, how does this look? What does this look like? You know, what's the characteristics of this? What makes you so confident? Where's the results? You know, and to me, that was really good because I don't mind being put on the mat. That's why I wanted to come on the show because I love the questions that you guys ask. I'm not a, I'm not great from an economics point of view because I am a stupid geologist, but at the same time, I love drilling holes and I am a mine, a mining guy. I love mining and I love turning deposits, only deposits that are worth mining into mines. So, I, I, that's yeah. what I love doing. Yeah. So, so you, you guys, you, you put a, a line through the, um, you know, s sale of the company or, or sale of the asset because of the, the administration dynamics. And um, so, we, you know, we, we address that. I guess I'm trying to also put a line through, um, you know, just using equity markets at a, at a, at a less aggressive uh, discount. So, I mean, I mean, were, were there market soundings <laughs> conducted to, you know, to, yeah. to perform an equity raise at, at you know, a 30% yeah. discount to last instead of a, a 50? And yeah, look, what happened and, there? And, uh, 
we didn't really get a good response, to be honest. Um, when you're a negative cash flow gold producer and people don't quite believe the story about never, never at time, I, I think there was a lack of of understanding and, and you know, partially probably due to the fact that I wasn't massively promoting a negative cash flow business. We we did have an amazing deposit, but the thing is I don't expect people to listen when you're losing that much money every quarter um, because they just don't want to know. I mean, I don't want to throw my money into a company where if, if I think it's going to go out the back door on on debts or, or, or credit arrangements, you know, with an administration that was supposedly pending. So, you know, that was a difficult conversation but and, and a harsh realisation for us. You know, could we go out to the equity markets and do a 30% discount? Everybody said no. You know, we, we yeah, probably so, could. So the we market probably sounding with, was it with well, Canaccord or was it? Yeah, well, well, to a few different people, but we was probably it, could have got Shanti? 20 million bucks. Was it, was it Canaccord? Was it, who, who, oh, look, who I, won't, it? I won't go into details. Uh, obviously, we're pretty close to Canaccord and, and Shanti helped us out with the with the um, the funding arrangements in this case. So that, that you know, obviously you partner up when you can. I was just try- um, I'm I- trying to wonder if, um, I mean, obviously, you know, Sternship and, and uh, would it would have probably been encouraging the uh, the Tembo angle because it looks like they clipped a pretty good ticket on the way there. Did they introduce Tembo? And is that is that the source of their fee? Um, they they did bring Tembo around, yeah. And yeah. obviously, the prior relationship there was quite helpful. Yeah, um, with John and, and Tim Dudley. Yeah, so but they got paid zero point nine million. Um, oh, of course. Yeah, Everyone so, gets paid fees, right? Yeah, totally. Because no one does anything for free. Yeah. Well, I, I guess <laughs> you, you guys I just... worked as analysts, right? So you, you would have got paid your fees as well. So you get it. <laughs> you got to you got to pay the uh, the engineering, mate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm just wondering, like, was there another angle? Was there another alternative um, that yeah, maybe your yeah, advisors yeah. weren't promoting because it would be mate, less I, juicy I, I, fee I tell for you them? What. We we could have gone and got debt and paid thirty eight percent plus coupons and and yeah. who wants to do that right yeah. I could have raised twenty million bucks at thirty percent discount and then basically drilled and not been able to pay off um, pretty much any of our creditors and ended up back at the market in uh, in May probably now you know so it, there, there was very limited options about what we could have done there. Uh, and what I wanted to do was a fully funded option. Was was to make sure that we came in, we got a really good cornerstone. Tembo's, you know, viewed very favourably in the market in terms of their technical due diligence. They don't yep. seem to go out and do things that aren't worth doing. And for me, it was really healthy for them to come in and actually put us to the sword and say, "Why should we invest?" And I really enjoyed that process. And then they put their money where their mouth is, and now we're doing what we're doing. And and I think it's you know, it really is paying off. We've got three drill rigs up there at the moment spinning. Uh, putting results out and building a, a mineral resource update by mid-year. I want to be able to come to diggers with a with a substantial increase to what we've got. We built 300,000 ounces at, at 4.6 where there were zero ounces in less than 12 months. And, and I want to be able to keep pushing that and growing that resource and finding other ones because to me, getting a five-year mine plan in front of pre-built infrastructure is the holy grail. We, before we, we want to, we will give you the floor for never, never results at, at some stage, Simon. Or I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting there, mate. Trust me. That's it right. won't That's be right. void. But I just want to ask about the the open pit, the uneconomic nature of it. Like as you said, it re- the resource was sub of one gram, but there there is open pits that do profit off sub one gram. What what is it a, a function? Was it mostly the recovery, or was it high stripping ratio, or why was it? Yeah, it's a good question, Matt, and and I wouldn't expect anything less of you, mate. So if you look at um, Capricorn, who I think are the shining star of mining lower grade deposits, right? They have a really good strip ratio, and and having a conversation with Mark Clark in the past, he said, you know, if you have a deposit that you really want to, you know, go and mine and and take the risk on, you need to drill it out, and that's what they did with with the Carla Winder deposit, and I think that's why they're able to achieve what they can achieve. They've got a a low strip ratio, but they have a very good all body knowledge, so. They've, they're doing that in a very systematic way. And I'm kind of, you know, I'm learning from some of the best in the business. And for me, it's about drilling this thing out uh, and making sure that we're super confident and we have all the all body knowledge so that when we decide to turn the key on the plant, that we're not going to be taking unnecessary risk. So, with the now, you never, never results today. You've released 50 meters at six and a half grams and mm-hmm. 14 meters at 23, uh, sorry, 10 meters at. 23.7 so for for gold intersections as, as you said the width because 
with width becomes a lot less dilution. You can have a metre of dilution on 20 metres, that's 5%, whereas a metre on three metres is 30. So it's like it's a big, big positive to have these thick widths. <laughs> and you've yeah. been there, and as you said, this was your only your only option was to find something to try and get you get Gascoigne out of this, and you've you've come out on the absolute best end of the spectrum you could have hoped for i assume 100 percent, mate. yeah look this is a ball terror to me it, it's 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 something that you only see once in in your career and and that's not me you know waxing superlative i am an md and we do talk optimistically and being a geologist we make lots of stuff up too but i'm hopeful that um even travis can see that the cross sections that we're putting out there i mean i'm trying to make Looks a good. point here i'm not i'm not <laughs> You're being given the trap <laughs> tick mate <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly not trying to um, pump. I won't say that I'm I'm not trying to promote because that's the job, right? I do want people to to notice this. I do want people to take notice of what this is because even even you know with mining, let's just say the gold price was much lower than what it is. If you're mining that 10 meter intersection, you're still making pretty good money, right? Like the expectation would was is that you would make really good money, but if the gold price keeps moving upwards, that that whole thick intersection uh, of lower grade material that's above it becomes huge optionality, right? Because then you can adopt different mining methods uh, and take the whole lot. And and given that we've got a two and a half million ton plant sitting right next to it, we've got plenty of options in that space. And to me, it was about taking Mike Clark's advice, drilling this thing out, working out how far down, how much further along strike, you know, how many more of these things are, because then we can basically line it up as a mine schedule in, in front of that plant. And I think it's just, it's simple. It's a, it's a very simple process. You, ca- you don't always get the opportunity to do it. Um, I'm just very lucky I've got an amazing team and we we do have the opportunity to do it in this case. Simon, I've got one for, for the geologists out there listening. I'm keen to sort of dig into your understanding. So Never Never Deposit is obviously much higher grade than anything that's been going into the mill so far. So I'm keen yes. to hear you sort of expand on like the, the team's understanding. It seems quite different in terms of its geology and the sort of yes. likelihood of any lookalikes and what you guys have got planned. Jeez, you're giving him the floor here, JD. <laughs> the geo side, this is God. I'll see you in 20 minutes. Well, we've, we've given a lot to the mining engineers <laughs> and to the finance people. I sort of share the love. <laughs> no, no, look, it, it, you're right. Um, and that was something we noticed very, very early on. But that's given us some clues as well. So it's a really good question. So Never Never is incredibly high silica content. Um, that, that lends itself really favorably towards a couple of different things. One of them is how do you remote sense? How do you use geophysics to go and find something like this? Obviously, you use a method that's really good at picking up silica. Now. I suppose there's no really good geophysical method to pick up silica, but if you have, a, let's say, a highly magnetic magnetic or EM-responsive stratigraphy around that silica, then you can actually see the negative response. And and I suppose the other thing is uh, resistivity, which is, you know, the ability for the ground to resist conductivity uh, is very high, very high resistivity in a a silica-rich intrusion which is what Never Never is. So we've used the SAM method um, just recently in conjunction with our drilling, uh, and that's proven really, really useful because what it's done is validate a lot of our sort of geology model um, about the orientation of this orbit because it is completely at right angles to the stratigraphy that we had been mining for, you know, kilometres in the Gilby's trend. And that's why we gave it a different name because it is completely different geology. It's very high silica, but it has affinities to the stratigraphic um, system. So Gilby's is a stratigraphic hosted ore body that is associated with a, a sort of a football shell unit. And there is a you know low grade, quite high volume deposit sitting above that. And that's the kilometer of north striking stuff that have been mined historically. This material is striking almost west uh, and it is very high silica. It doesn't have the same, um, let's say, chemistry. There's, there's not a lot of copper, zinc, lead, any of that deleterious stuff. There's no arsenic. It's, it's very much just gold with some pyrite. Uh, in a in a very highly flooded uh, environment, there's a lot of brecciation there, which is completely different. We know that this is far more structural than the stratigraphic host that we'd been mining previously. So there's there's many differences. But if I can sort of you know cut it short, because I'm not going to crap on about it for ages, because that's not what people are tuning in for. We see the same affinities in the the Gilby's pit. So you see these cross cutting structures that have been cross cutting this main ore body for for years and talking to the mine geologists who were walking the floor of the pit and marking out the blasts and stuff, they they say they'd seen this before. 
that would seen this high silica stuff before at these intersections of structure with stratigraphy. And that's this is a it's a fractal scale model, right? You take this giant ore body that we're defining 400 meters north of the pit and 600 meters uh, west of the plant, and you look back into the pit, and you can see these structures there. And we've drilled some of them, and they, they were the priority one targets we defined just recently. So the SAM survey is showing us further north. The stuff that we've mined before is showing us what's in the pit behind us. Uh, and we've got this never never in front of us. So we think with this, two or three of these um, structures, if not more. And that sort of different geology, does that give you any confidence? Obviously, it's pretty early on that the, the recoveries could be a lot better than what we were sort of seeing in the last few quarters before the yeah. Balgranger went on went on hold. Yeah. And so in answer to that question, and that's a good, a good one, because we are working very furiously on uh, metallurgical test work at the moment. Now, I want to put out something in the next couple of weeks, hopefully with the results coming back from that test work. We've been very comprehensive about what we've done there because I think I've alluded to it. Gascoigne has a legacy that I don't want um, to continue. I want Gascoigne to be seen as a company that you can look at and know. To change the company what. name coming. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> that, that's been talked about. But ultimately, I want, to, I want to let the facts speak for themselves and then we can change the name because I think ultimately people just want to see the actual facts change. So the facts for us is that we're going to categorically state the metallurgical recovery for this new deposit going forward. Uh, and there is no copper, there's no lead, there's no zinc, there's no appreciable silver, which is actually a problem in a lot of gold mines because you can recover all the gold, but you, if you end up with 30% silver, it, it takes away from you know your gold weights. You, your Dore bar might be 36 kilos, but it's only if it's only 25 kilos of gold, then it's it's actually disappointing. You get credits, but who cares? You want the gold. And what we can see here is there's none of that, right? You, you can oxidize that pyrite. You can smash up all of that quartz and you can get that gold out. We were bottle roll testing this on RC samples before, you know, the end of last year. We processed the laterite component of this through the plant towards the end of, of the production. Uh, and we can see the recoveries are very much greater than the Gilby's deposit. So we're very, very... Uh, let's say, positive about what we're seeing in the metallurgical test work initially, um, but we'll get those finalised results out to market and, and prove it with fact. Uh, Simo, the Gilby's pit, what, what role is that going to play in the future? Because I can't, I can't say you're getting two and a half million tonne out from an underground operation, but is yes. is that going to be, are you going to high grade it, at, run it at a lower mill rate, or are you going to chuck some uh, Gilby's dust in there to, to bump it up? <laughs> like, what's the... What's the strategy or still yet to be determined? No, look, it's very simple. Um, again, I'll, I'll throw back to my mind geologist, uh, the part the part of the geologist that I am, which is ultimately a mining guy. I, I work on the economics part of it. I won't say that I'm amazing at economics, but it's all about what can be done. And, and for me, when you have grade like this, uh, you have options. And so we have that pit sitting behind us, um, and if we want to go into it, we can go into it, if that's if that makes sense from an economics point of view. We did discover um, far more extensive veining in the in the eastern wall of Gilby's through uh, the latter part of last year, which we're working on a resource model for at the moment, and that gives us some optionality around, you know, going and mining some very low strip ratio, uh, low-grade ore tons to be able to blend with this high-grade material from underground, because as you refer to it, I mean, I'm... I'm applying a half million tonne per year sort of run rate for this underground and, and a half million tonne per year for the open pit. And at the grades that these um, the two different components are, uh, and, and assuming that the open pit doesn't grow too much more from where we're sitting at the moment in terms of that particular deposit, we might find another one. Um, but at this stage, I'm just assuming what we have in front of us uh, and then expanding the underground component of that. And then you're basically talking about a million tonnes at, you know, four grams at least. Uh, and then you've got plenty of options, right? So if you want to get it up to two and a half million tonnes, you can throw a bunch of different material in there. If that's Gilby's East, if that opens up toll treating uh, options, then that's what we'll look at. If it, if it makes sense, we'll do it. The other thing is we're looking at what we can do with the throughput. Can we drop the throughput and increase recoveries even further than what we expect? You know, if we ran it at two million tonnes per annum and just kept a bit more residence time for the ore that's in there and ground it a bit finer, would you get 94 plus percent? And I'm I'm liking the things I'm seeing. And I think, you know, these are all great options to have. So never, never. Where did that come from? <laughs> I might know the answer to this. 
Well, I'm 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 hoping you do, mate, because uh, all deposits at Dalgaranga are named after gin, and that was prior to my arrival. But um, I'm a big fan of gin, and I spent a bit of time at the flower factory uh, on Queen Street in central Perth there, and I was introduced to a South Australian gin called Never Never One Evening, one drunken evening, <laughs> uh, and really enjoyed that gin. Uh, and it stuck with me because it's just it's such an amazing product, uh, and they have plenty of different types of gin. And when I saw this deposit and I thought, well, that's pretty unique. How about we give it this name? And it has that wistful element to it. And I've been given a bit of grief about, you know, down to the Never Never and Alice in Wonderland and all these different things. But at the end of the day, you know, geology is about having that kind of mythical aspect to it. Not a lot of people understand exactly how we do what we do. A lot of deposits are found by accident most of the time, but you put yourself in the right place at the right time with, with a drill rig you give yourself the opportunity to have that intersection with opportunity and it coincides and you find a deposit. You know, the same can be said of, of de Grissa, the same can be said of, you know, the Jubilee story with Cosmos Nickel Mine. There was lots of things happening there that weren't all, you know, you didn't know what you were going to find, but you were in the right place at the right time with the right attitude and funding to go and do it. And things happen, you know, amazing things happen. Nice. Oh, so I'm glad no one's picked. No one's gone down the Michael Jackson route of never, never, never land. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> but mate, no, uh, no. Thank, thanks, Abe, for uh, thanks, Abe, for coming on, mate. And uh, uh, Trav, uh, it's good to see Trav still doesn't give up. And uh, I reckon, <laughs> no, I reckon, no, he, I reckon he did. I reckon Simon, buddy. Uh, you, I don't know if you've met your match, Trav, but that was a good. Year. No, I, no. I reckon that was bloody good. Yeah, well answered questions. I think. Um, uh, and, and happy to take more offline, mate. I'm, <laughs> I love I love the cross section debate. Of uh, <laughs> uh, that's a favourite of mine, mate. That uh, was uh, it was a good one. I think that one's still going. They've uh, they've removed the uh, the photos of drill core from today's announcement. So I think that's a win for the money of mine team. <laughs> um, and the, uh, and this this isn't a battle, is it? Oh, mate, everything's a battle with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so mate, we look at, we look forward to uh, chucking this uh, link on hot copper. That'll get us some uh, good views. I probably probably wouldn't read the comments. But, uh, oh, even yeah, we're, it, even it, we're it getting hammered is, on mate. Twitter and uh, Twitter and not copper, mate. That means that means we're getting the reach. Exactly. You can't please everyone, but people are looking at what you're doing, right? And, and well, Simon, I got a, um, you know with the name change that you you flagged. Um, mm -hmm. Just got a quick recommendation. Don't choose the name of the nearby town because it didn't work out too well for Orabanda and Waluna. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, come on. Oh, look, Aura, Aura is going to do amazingly because yeah. they've got a really good bloke running the company. Luke Cray is, is amazing. Yeah, so, what's the, what's oh. the management premium on that company at the moment? <laughs> well, you know, you could ask that about a, a few different companies, but yeah. a lot of guys that came out of Northern Star and girls that came out of Northern Star have gone off to do uh, really, really amazing <laughs> things, you know. I mean, you had Bill on the other day. You had Stralo there. You, you know, to me, Luke Cray is doing a great job at Aura and. There's plenty of other stories out there, and, and that was a real good incubator for some very astute people. So, you know, great story, for Northern Star coming from nothing, basically, to, to something amazing, and then everybody's gone off to do amazing things on the back of that. They don't remember, don't forget I did 18 months there. And so look I'm, at Matt. Exactly. <laughs> look, look at what Matt the cream did. of the crop. <laughs> oh, jeez. Right, mate. Uh, thanks All very right. much. And look, Matt, um, we look forward to uh, – seeing what this never never turns into because it's uh look at, at first first glance at the moment these thicknesses and grades um you're on to something pretty bloody special which is yeah quite quite fitting considering where the company and the the journeys come from so yeah feet in the fire mate it only happens when your feet are in the fire how That's much put, how much do you put down to a bit of luck that you've hit oh, this yeah. <laughs> Mate, look, like I say, it's about being in the right place at the right time and drilling the holes. There is some luck involved, but I like to think that, you know, you have to you have to be in the right place, ask the right questions, and then execute. Because and so what? I guess what have you got a bit of a timeline on um, progressing towards fees, res yeah. reserves, and stuff like that for never yeah, never. Yeah. So so we've put it all out, and we're going to stick to that timeline. We're on track um, to achieve uh, resource updates every six months. So our first one in that regard will be around June, July, prior to diggers. Um, and then our reserve process will start early in the new year in 24. And then we'll have a feasibility running with that. And then we'll reach a, a financial investment decision uh, by the middle of 24 to yep. restart the plant or, or to keep drilling. 
Too, right? If you can use Entech, mate, that'll validate the sponsorship he's given me over the years. So that'll be appreciated. <laughs> hey, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of Macca and his team. They're, they're amazing people. So you know that that's what this this industry is about is amazing people. That's what I love about it. It's a small industry, so you have to be careful what you say and the enemies you make. But uh, you know, to me, there's a lot of really good people all working together, and it's it's yeah, it's great. It's a great place to be. Oh, that's good. I've just validated my uh, monthly fee there. Beautiful. Uh, <laughs> sweet as, mate. We'll, uh, we'll talk soon, mate. We'll look forward to having you on again. See you, mate. Cheers, mate. Thanks, Arnie. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Arnie. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Enjoy. Beautiful. Beautiful. Good chat. What do you reckon, Trav? How'd you like the back and forth, mate? I like it. I'd, good to see you weren't giving up on that uh, dilutionary topic. Yeah, well, if you, if you were an existing shareholder, like imagine you rode Gascoigne the whole way. Like, you know, you, if you if you invested uh, back in back in ramp up when it was becoming a mine, you'd have 10 fifths of sweet nothing right now. Um, and that sad story is, yeah, been the continuing um, journey for, for Gascoigne shareholders. Uh, like the entry point was awesome if you could get in on that deal, Tembo deal. Wow, what an, what an amazing deal they've done. And if you were a new shareholder as part of that raise, it's a pretty great outcome as well. But um, but it does it does suck if if you were an existing shareholder and you see that 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 immediate write down. I think that was the crux of what I was trying to get to. Is you know, were there other options on the table that they could have considered? And and granted, those other options probably wouldn't have resulted in the upside that can come in due course from um, Never Never, and that looks pretty damn promising. Um, and, and you know, but I, I was just curious to really understand the thinking at the board and management level there. Uh, I think that, as you said, there's a a long time to hang on before they get back to neutral, but there is a lot of potential for that deposit to generate a lot of cash once it gets going with those grades and widths. So, uh, good stuff.